I'd like to introduce our next speakers, uh, Andrzej Targosz, Łukasz Targosz and Magdalena Jensen. And they're going to talk about when you realize your band is a business, how to take off your skinny jeans to put on a suite. Just to remind you, this is discussion panel. And if you get any question, just please raise your hand and wait for the microphone. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you. So the last panel, if you were here, um, spoke about the changes taking place in the music industry, uh, digitalization and so on. Um, we're going to expand a bit on that, but specifically focus on how to make a living as a band. So imagine this, um, I'm starting a band. I've done it once or twice, so it's not that far-fetched. And so I've got my guitar, I've got my drummer, my bassist, um, I've got my skinny jeans, hair gel, pretty much ready to go, right? Eyeliner. Eyeliner. Um, I've even got a gig booked, so all that's left to do is play the, a few gigs, watch the money and the honey roll in, right? Sadly, it's not that simple. So um, we're going to talk about how you, how it's possible to make a sustainable living as a band. And I wanted to ask you guys first, who in the audience is a musician? Musicians, hands up. Keep your hands raised, please. If your hands are up, um, how many of you make a living primarily as a musician? So maybe about half, probably less than that. Yeah. So. That's what we're going to focus on. And to start, uh, we have Magda, who is living in Warsaw, um, promoting bands there, and also helping Polish bands export their, export their music, uh, play abroad, as well as bringing uh, bands from abroad to Poland. So Magda's going to give a short presentation to introduce the topic. We're all going to partake in the presentation. Yes. It, we mm -hmm. found, when we were talking about the panel earlier, we found out that a lot of the topics that I kind of thought to speak on, everybody else also thought to speak on. Um, so, uh, one of the kind of biggest things that I hear from most musicians is, you know, hey, I want to have fun. I want to play in a band. I want to play in front of a bunch of people. I want to make a lot of money. I want to be famous. Well... <laughs> That's awesome, but uh, a lot of these people it's forget. Normal. <laughs> and it's super awesome. I think that's a great, great idea, great goal. But uh, what a lot of musicians forget is that what they're actually doing is creating a business and they're creating an institution. In one of the bands that I manage, um, Paul and Carol, we often call everybody involved with us our institution. And sometimes our institution is a little bit screwed up and things are falling apart and sometimes our institution works really well. Um, and I just wanted to show you guys a few of the examples of who are people in your institution. Um, what are the roles of people that are involved in your institution or your company? Obviously, if you're thinking about it as a business, which is what you should be. So you have your fellow band members, you have your general manager, you have your booker, you have your agent representing you in various territories uh, or to various companies. You have your tour manager, you have your graphic designer, you have your social media manager, you have your technicians, you have your PR agents, you have your drivers. You have everybody involved, and very often a lot of these people are <laughs> one and the same, uh, as is often the case with a lot of Polish bands. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that these roles are super important, and they all like come together to create your business and your institution. And that's kind of the key uh, element here. What we want to explain to everybody is that, yes, you're a band. Yes, you're on stage. Yes, you have your people uh, playing the guitar next to you, playing the bass, playing the drums, but... They're also the people that are here creating your business together with you. They're creating, and they're, they need to be taking on these various different kinds of roles. Because from, obviously from the very beginning, most bands don't have the opportunity to actually hire a manager, to actually have a separate person as a tour manager, to actually have a technician. So very often, you all have to work together and pull together to make these things happen. But they are, regardless, of, if they don't exist as separate people, there are super important roles to create. Um, and one of the reasons that I separated it all out as well is that it's really important that you realize that you can actually delegate tasks. It's not necessary that one person has to do all of this. It's not necessary that the lead singer has to be the person in charge of everything. Everybody can take a little bit of a part in it, and that's actually super important. Do you guys have anything to say about that? <laughs> it's a super great model of, uh, how to say it, uh, the best way you can make it. Um, 
So, uh, something that I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about are some things that I, in my opinion, uh, Polish bands need a little bit more of. We saw in the last, or we heard in the last panel about music, the different kinds of changes and things that are coming up in the music industry. And as you'll see on my next slide, a lot of those changes require a change in attitude. Um, and so one of the key things that Polish people need to start learning, and this is something that is societally wide, actually I heard Max talking about it earlier, um, when he was talking about startups in Central Eastern Europe, um, it, attitude is super key. Leadership is super key. Your attitude towards leadership, the way you approach people is super key. It's super important to have a positive attitude. It's important to be open. These are things that are, for someone like me, as an American, coming to Poland, so obvious, but so not necessarily obvious for the average Polish person. Um, they might be really obvious for people at events like this because that's what we're all here for. We're here to meet people, we're here to network. But when you get invited to these kinds of events or showcase festivals that are very often something that Polish bands and bands in general do, make sure you take advantage of those opportunities. Make sure you go and talk to people. Make sure you come to up to people with a, we can do this approach, we're here, we're gonna have a good time. We're able to play this concert even if our bass amp has <laughs> exploded on stage or whatever. Um, Make sure you keep maintain a positive attitude and have a positive outlook about where things are going. Um, the worst is when you have a band that says, you know, oh, I'd really like to start playing at some tours in Germany, but can't do that. Don't know how, it's too hard, too big of a market, I don't speak the language, I have no idea who to contact. That's like literally the most ridiculous attitude of all time. Of course you can. There are people too, they go to concerts too, just go, meet them and stay open about it. And then something that I want to come to a lot later in the talk is openness about finances and about money um, that I think is something that is something very key missing in the Polish music industry that I think is something that's a lot more that we can learn from someone like Andrzej or whatever from the tech or people like Andrzej from the tech side because I think there's a lot more discussion um, in the entrepreneurship, the tech world, the startup world about money. Um, and so I want to come back to that as well. Uh, and I wanted to show you guys some facts and figures. If you weren't sitting in on the last um, panel, uh, Piotr Kabay showed you a lot of global figures. I wanted to give you a really quick rundown of some Polish-specific figures um, because I think that they give bands a really good jumping off point for starting to plan what we'll be getting to, the business element of a band. So first of all, how does the market in Poland look? 32% of Poles listen to music in their leisure time. That's a third of the population. So that's a third of 40 million people. That's a big market. There's a big market potential there. 91% of internet users in Poland listen to music through radio. So radio is a super key element. We already know that. 81% uh, of internet users download music, both legally and illegally. So that's something else to keep in mind when you're thinking about where you're putting your music online and how you're putting it online. Able to, if you're putting it on to just be listened to online or if you're putting it online to be also downloaded. Um, and then the last key fact uh, is that 71% of users, internet users, use streaming services. And as we saw in the last uh, panel as well, 91% of those streaming services is usually YouTube. Um, so that's something that's really key to keep in mind is YouTube, how you keep your YouTube channel, um, how you how you brand your YouTube channel, how you maintain your YouTube channel, what you put under your YouTube videos, all of those things are super key. Um, and if you have more questions about those kinds of things in detail, please do come talk to me afterwards. I just wanna breeze through this so that we get an under, underlying um, basic common understanding of what we're talking about. So, with all of those kind of figures and ideas of how the music market looks in Poland, how is it actually changing as well? So in 2012, if you measure Poland's music market in terms of sales, the worth was 255 million złoty. That's a lot of money, but it's declining. Trends show that it's declining. So SPAV, so that's the um, Union of Audio Producers, Audio, Audio Visual Producers, SPAV, um, they posted an estimated figure that this year the market value will measure 243 million, and that is mainly due to a decline in significant decline in physical sales, but they estimate a, a rather large growth of 10 million złoty in digital sales. 
Piotr Kabai, uh, I pulled this fact straight out of an interview with him in Gazette de Borcha not long ago, the last one, that 80,000, he estimates that approximately 80,000 pe 80, people in Poland have Spotify, Wimp, or Deezer premium accounts. So those are people who are paying to be listening to streaming music online. That's not that many in a, lar in a scale of 80, uh, 40 million people as well. Um, so when you think about these kinds of things, the changes, so changes towards more online, changes more towards digital, and obviously, I mean, streaming has only existed in Poland for the past two years or so. So in, in the, and when you think about all of these things, that gives you kind of a, as a band, as a musician, that gives you a basis for starting to plan what you're going to do and how you're going to reach your pe how you're going to reach people how you're going to reach your audience so uh -huh. what does all this mean for you as a musician so all as i said facts and figures key to understanding your target and they're the stepping point to modeling your business plan um, <laughs> business plans i don't know if any of you guys have ever written one uh, put your hands up if you have anyone written a business plan two both are few more musicians, very good. Three, four, very good. Five, oh, more musicians, good. So some of you musicians actually know how to write a business plan. Well, you can start applying it as well to your band, not just to your businesses, not just to your side jobs, actually applying it straight up to your band. Um, <laughs> these guys over here are gonna laugh at me because that's not something we've actually done for our band, but it is something I've done for other bands and it is actually something that's super important. So. Biz step number one to writing your business plan. Have a solid product. And in this case, your product is your music. Have good music. Have music that people want to listen to. Very simple way to find out. Have a, have a couple of concerts, and do people come? Do they keep coming to your concerts? That's the key. You're going to know if they like it. Um, set goals for yourself. When I write business plans for my bands, or when I put our like strategic plans set up, I usually set them up in a one-year step, two-year steps, and then five-year steps. So you kind of envision where you want to be in one year as a band, where you want to be in two years as a band, and where do you want to be in five years as a band. Um, then obviously identify your audience, super key. You can use a lot of data for that that the, everyone was referring to in the last panel. At the very end, they were starting to talk about how key data is and how key analytics are. I would suggest as a band checking your Spotify analytics because they're very easily accessible as of the last like two months or so. Um, check your YouTube analytics. That's going to show you where people are listening to your music, where people are watching your videos from. That's going to suggest where you want to start playing your concerts. Is it mostly in Poland as a Polish band? If so, great. What cities? Break it down so you know where you want to start booking your shows. That's going to give you literal like facts to show promoters. I have this many people in your city that are watching my YouTube videos. I want to book a show here. You should be paying me to do so. Um, so identify your audience, and then uh, identify your revenue streams. This is something that becomes challenging because there are so many different possible revenue streams, and there are so many new revenue streams, which is something, obviously, that we're all here talking about. Um, but one of the main streams of revenue is live, obviously. Second stream of revenue, streaming and uh, purchasing of music. Um, and what, else? what other streams? Right. Obviously, then there are all sorts of new streams of revenue, such as advertising, working with ban uh, brands, sponsorship, etc. cetera. Uh, and then step, five, uh, step four, set up a budget and action plan. And this is kind of something I wanted us to all focus on together because I think this is something that uh, these guys have a lot more experience with um, and uh, also can contribute, Andrzej particularly through an entrepreneurial perspective can contribute to. Um, and then step five, take your action steps and actually put them into action, get to work. Well, this is where I wanted to break in for a second, um, because what we're trying to get at through this is essentially thinking of your band as a startup. And since Anjay would be the token startup expert on the, on the panel, I wanted to ask him a bit his thoughts on how would you approach a band in this way? Where would you start? So I think that when we uh, when you think about think about music industry, it's similar to tech scene and tech industry. So it's something similar to startups. So you, I think that we are living in the uh, revolution time and new industry revolution, which we can see all around us. And that's what I can see. I think that musicians should think about um, about their art like as a business, as a startup. So you have to find 
some solid financial structure for it. You have to think about budget and things like that. So it's a similar. I think that all of the mission world, especially in Poland, is, uh, let's say, about a few years behind all of the startup scene. I mean, startup tech scene. So I think that we are going on a good way. So we have to think about all, all about, about music, like a business, nothing else. Well, um, Wukash, you have managed to do this. Um, you were one of the few who kept their hands raised on that second question I asked. So maybe let's have your story. How have you managed to make a living as a musician in Poland? Well, to tell you the truth, I, I did it, but uh, not with the band, because uh, uh, I truly regret, but uh, nobody nobody's showed me something like that uh, uh, 20 years ago. Maybe I would be more you know, experienced, because uh, I, I, I really believe that uh, in the end of, uh, of the composing process, on the recording process, on creating art, uh, it's uh, in, in the final point it's kind of uh, I hate this uh, word but it's a kind of product especially these days so uh, uh, and 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 the access to the music as we said before is uh, it's normal for everybody in the car in the uh, elevator whatever you are you can listen to the music so uh, you really have to transform your, your, your way of thinking to the, the modern ways and uh, uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't uh, treat your music uh, like a final product, uh, uh, you will be killed by others. So uh, in the big, big uh, world war. So uh, yeah, uh, I think it's uh, it's quite important to uh, to try to think about your art like uh, it's a kind of uh, of job uh, job that is your passion. You you love it, but. Uh, in the end of uh, of the story, you have to earn money uh, uh, using it. So, because you have to live, uh, you have to pay, and etc. So, uh, and especially for Polish people, well, because I, I don't know why, but we are we, we are a little bit ashamed uh, when we are talking about the art and the and the money. It's it's so common. Uh, it always was when Mozart, for example, or Bach were uh, composing the the biggest. Uh, 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 pieces, uh, the, the orders always were, were, were a, a kind of king or queen or, 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 or someone who paid for it. So it's pretty normal that uh, when, uh, when you have money, you will always find the art. And when you have art, you always find the money. So that's my comment on that. Um, speaking about money, and the reason that I put a uh, budget, set a budget up here in step number four as the first point of step number four is because I have heard numerous stories from Polish bands that I will not name of them living far over their living, not even living off of their music, first of all, but actually playing over their means, I guess. So um, speaking to some really professional musicians uh, who we would all recognize if I would start to mention them, but they have told me horror stories in my mind where the musicians at the end of the day end up paying to play. They're not playing, paying the venue, uh, but they're they, the way that they've set up their whole structure is broken because they're having to pay their sound technician, they're having to pay their lighting guy, they're having to pay their drum technician, they're having to pay their driver, and they're having to pay their manager. And in the end, the four musicians left in the band have zero dollars to take home, have to take money out of their, band, their bank accounts to actually pay these people. Stop. Rewind. Ridiculous. Set up your budgets, be realistic, and live within your means. Just because you're being you want to be professional doesn't mean that you have to have a sound technician. Just because you want to be professional doesn't mean you have to have um, a lighting technician. Like, work towards those goals, but the only way that you can get to those places, realistically, is to actually step by step get there, and the only way that you can get there is to, buy, is to work within a budget, because that's the only way that you're gonna end up having profits. Well, at one point, are those things part of an acceptable risk? Because say if, you're, if you have a startup, um, you're almost expected to you know, sleep in the office, eat ramen noodles, you know, work 80 hour weeks for at least the first few months. And say the band equivalent is that, you know, buying instruments out of your personal bank account, you know, paying for some of these things, as an investment that you think will pay off eventually in the future? Like, uh, is there a border at which it's too much? 
I think that it's a similar story like with all of the startups with uh, like software houses and other companies. So we got the same problems. Okay, it's much way easier for them because it's really it's quite easy to find uh, investments from big companies, and it's so common to put some money into the let's say tech tech startup, tech company, not a music band. But maybe you know someone who tr should try to change it a little bit. Well, what you were saying, really quickly before I come to that, I wanted to talk about acceptable risks. There are very few things, in my opinion, out of the list of people that I was mentioning that you have to pay that are le legitimately acceptable risks of unacceptable expenditures. Your unacceptable expenditure when you're at the beginning of your, your whole existence as a band is your equipment so that you can make your music. It's yourself, like feeding yourselves so that you can eat, so that you can live to play your next show. And it's investing in a driver's license so that you can drive yourself so you don't have to drive a man, so you don't have to drive, hire a driver. And that's about it. If you start to hear after two or three shows that you sound like shit on stage, then you can start to think is an acceptable risk to take on a sound guy. Screw everything else and you'll get there eventually because you're gonna sound good, you're gonna, people are gonna like your shows and the more money is gonna co keep coming in and then you're gonna be, start to be able to add more risks, let's say more elements to the puzzle. Okay. Um, Andrew, did you want to keep commenting? No, no, no? that's fine. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a little bit, hang on, what was my next slide? Yes, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the action plan part of uh, being in a band. We, one thing that I want you guys to remember is, yes, you're working to create a professional business, but you're also in a creative business. You're musicians. Use that, stay creative, be creative, be creative about financing. As I said uh, just a second ago, you don't have to have a driver. A creative way to handle getting places is using your own driver's license and borrowing your mom's car and driving somewhere. Like There are so many different ways to finance things and to get things done that you don't actually have to uh, go this kind of like standard, professional, whatever, run-of-the-mill route. Um, another thing that I wanted to make sure that you guys all, were, well obviously make great music, like that's like one of the most obvious things that you have to do as a band. But also what they were saying in the last, I think Ashwin said this in the last uh, panel, use your contacts, meet people, and remember those people, and make sure you remember who they are, note them down, keep their um, business cards, write follow-up emails after you meet them, and just file away who all of these people are because you literally never know when you might be driving through Brussels and need to somewhere to crash for the night because you're coming home from tour. And you might have met some guy from Brussels a couple weeks ago, et cetera, et cetera. Keep those kinds of things in mind. People will generally be quite willing to help you out. Mm. Another part of being creative and incorporating these kinds of things into your business plan is borrow and utilize cool ideas. So then when you think about your revenue streams as part of your um, how you're making money, you have merchandise. Be super creative about merchandise. You don't actually have to make high-end, expensive t-shirts. Um, with Paula and Kettle, for example, we have done t-shirts twice. One time, great success. Second time, total fail. First time, great success. We bought t-shirts at secondhand stores around the city of Warsaw or in the countryside. If some band members happen to be in the countryside, they just picked them up at a secondhand store for like a zwote each washed them all, created a design, hand screen printed them ourselves, and those sold out like crazy because it's just an original idea. It's cool, it also fit the aesthetic of the band. The time that we had t-shirts printed by a, a professional printing company, I think I have like 600 t-shirts sitting in my house. Exaggeration, but there are a bunch of them there, there are a bunch of them at the rehearsal space, and they're just sitting there and nobody wants to buy them. <laughs> so get creative about that kind of stuff. Work on merch that works, uh, that works to your image as well. Um, and uh, something that I wanted to give you guys as a little tip, I started doing this recently, just Google, uh, Google things for, Google ideas, merch ideas. Put it into Google, you'll be shocked at how many interesting things that you never thought of pop up. Um, something that I wanted to have these guys also speak on, um, and I think Wukash in particular can speak to this, is exploit new technologies to create new opportunities for yourself. So 
uh, when you're thinking about how, what your revenue streams look like, there are so many different things that you can do with your music. Something that I just learned recently, and it was so obvious to me, such a dumb moment afterwards, was that uh, when you're recording an album, you should be getting, you should obviously master your entire album, but you should master your instrumental tracks as well. Because your instrumentals are a gigantic potential money maker. You can sell a fragment of your instrumentals from your song, 30 seconds, for several thousands Walta, and it's, you, you can sell it to anybody because people need it to put into an ad, they need it to put into a ringtone, whatever, and that's a super easy way to make money. I would add, uh, add one thing here, and uh, of course it's a, a brilliant idea, and it works really because uh, uh, commercial uh, companies are looking and seeking for new music, new original music for commercials, and I would say that I know, uh, I know the, the cases that uh, commercial companies are paying to unknown band a lot of money for for their music to uh, to their company, so uh, com uh, commercial company. So, so uh, it's good idea to prepare your pieces, uh, cut them to to let's say 30 or 45 seconds uh, 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 pieces, ready to uh, uh, to go to to commercial because that's a potential way of money, of course. But ag again, it's great promotion. If you have your song in. Uh, uh, let's say Polish uh, TV. Uh, you have a, you have a free uh, uh, advertising for for your music, and people are especially in internet again. They are looking for uh, 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 for your music. There is a website called, as far as I know, mu mu music from uh, uh, advertising and, and, and cinema, what something like that. And there are a lot of people that are seeking for uh, for new, uh, brand new tunes uh, used in in commercial. And the last thing, if when you uh, finally have your record and you are talking with uh, a, a, a label company, you can always uh, uh, publish or, or license your music in the um, uh, uh, music library, which is worldwide. And, and, and sometimes you, you even don't expect uh, the great uh, uh, feedback from them. So it's, it's good to, to have these things in mind. Exactly to that point, what I wanted to add as well is that particularly for bands from Poland and particularly for bands that do sing in English, you have a gigantic opportunity to sell your music in the United States, for example, to Hollywood for movies, for film trailers, for television commercials, for TV movies, because uh, I've spoken to many music supervisors that live, are living in Los Angeles and they say that they're dying to discover bands, they're dying to be A, the first to discover bands, and they usually look to Europe first because the majority of American music supervisors are just buying American music. But there's tons of English language, and it doesn't necessarily have to be English language, but tons of English language music abroad that the smarter music supervisors are sourcing from Europe. Thank you. I just want to add one comment to this East, because uh, actually if it's the East, uh, let's say it's to the East for every startup. If we replace music uh, with what, let's say, product, it's perfect. Well, I wanted to address the elephant in the room and address you two. Um, how do you get away from the stigma that you're selling out? Uh, uh, so, like, how do you, how do you, say you're managing an artist and they're like, no man, that's selling out, like we just want to play our music. Like how do you get past that? How do you explain all this? This is a topic I almost don't even want to touch with a 10 foot pole because this is one of the most prevalent topics in all of my bands. Um, and we ended up selling out uh, to a commercial last year to a bank um, and made a bunch of money because we wanted to record a new album. <laughs> And we wanted to record it with a better producer so that we could have well-produced music so that we could sell our music again abroad. So that's, I mean, you just talk about... The stigma of selling out, I think, is something that it only exists in this part of the world still. I don't think it exists in the United States anymore. I don't think it exists in Western countries anymore because it's such a normal part of how people are making music um, and how people are living from their music. Um, and I think that that's something that Polish bands have to literally bite the bullet and get over. Uh, if you want to live off of music, if you want to have a house, if you want to support your children, and if you want to support your family, you have to start making money off your music. One of the only ways to do so is to start selling your music to commercials and to start selling and to start col collaborating with brands. And that's pretty much a bottom line. You just have to get over it. 
Wukash, do you have anything to add on that? I think I have nothing to add because I, I truly believe that uh, you can create real art and you can and, and real art ca can be uh, commercial. So uh, 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 if it wouldn't be, uh, you, you don't you, you don't have Coldplay and and many other bands and artists. So uh, uh, of course uh, the fashion for the music is changing all, all the time, uh, but. Uh, uh, you, you can follow it, uh, you, or you don't have to follow it. Whatever it, it, uh, as I said before, it's always think of of heart or, or of uh, of your soul that is put in your in your music. So it, that's all the that, that think of you know something that is uh, even more important than all all these uh, you know XLS files and uh, things like that. It's it's pure art. So, but it can be commercial. I truly believe it. Well, I wanted to ask you specifically because you make music for films, and that's that seems to be a perfect combination of earning money while keeping your creative integrity, especially if these are more independent films, like something you really believe in. So how did you get into that, and what advice do you have for any composers, musicians who want to do that? How did I went into I, I, I'm confused. Into uh, film music, okay. composing how, how, how music for film. How I went into uh, film music, yes. you asked me about? Well, I, I was playing a, a guitar for years, and I, I, I found it quite nice. But I wanted to be to more. I wanted to 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 to, to be more creative. And uh, uh, one day, uh, I I had an opportunity to to be in a contest for the uh, big Polish uh, TV series, and uh, I just did it. So, and I and I, and I found my passion. So uh, that's how I, I found it really. I wanted to add one thing to the um, sellout point. And <laughs> I don't know if this is true for everybody, but I know a lot of musicians who are uh, who feel like if they see their song in a McDonald's ad, for example, that it's literally like going to break their heart and they're never going to be able to hear their song again. They never even want to get on stage and play it again. My suggestion to that kind of solution is sell your music very far away. In parts of the world, will you were n we will never see that McDonald's ad. They're still going to buy it. It's still going to be there. You're still going to make the money off of it, but you're not going to break your heart. <laughs> well, or also sell it to the little burger stand in the corner that's going to use it and you believe in and they make organic, super awesome burgers or something. Or that too. Um, uh, the last point that I wanted to make, and I want to make sure that you guys don't confuse this with, uh, look, anyway, don't be afraid to give your music away for free. And when I say that, I don't mean let people take your music and put it on their ad, put it in their video, and not credit you and not get, pay you for it, because you should always be credited and you should always be paid for the use of your music. However, uh, giving away your music is a way to create, to build up your fan base. It's a way to interact with your fans. It's a way to give something to your fans. They're pretty much able to get it for free anyway, so who really cares at that point? Like, just give your music, give a song away to your fans. They're gonna love you. They're gonna go buy your album if you give them the first song for free. That's just how it works. Yeah, but on, on, on the other hand, you always have to consider the value of, of potential uh, uh, promotion of the music, let's say, uh, in TV. I, I was working with... Uh, yeah, I, I got a, 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 um, the question from my uh, fellows from the band uh, if I can use very, very songs in TV series I was, uh, uh, I was uh, scoring for. And uh, I said, okay, I can talk to the producers, uh, we, we, we can make it. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll back with some feedback in, let's say, two, two weeks. And a, pr a producer were, uh, was uh, interested uh, and I said to them, okay, if they, uh, if they use them, I, I cannot guarantee you any fees. Like, uh, of course, you can. You have to uh, sign an agreement for, let's say, 1,000 slotties, But it's it's not, they won't, won't pay any more because they always can use uh, uh, international library. So uh, if you if you have this kind of opportunity, you always have to consider if it's worth or not. Uh, because sometimes uh, uh, if if you if you put the music into, let's say, TV series, it could be a blast uh, uh, success in, in a few months regarding concerts, because, like I said, people are looking for it. So, and what, what has happened? Uh, I put it into the, uh, the TV series, and then uh, uh, the paper w was sent to, to the TV station that they want like uh, $20 or something. So, you know, it's... it's uh, 
I would recommend to to uh, to be serious and uh, uh, you know uh, don't push your luck when you <laughs> when you get the deal. Well, but speaking to that point, I mean, you can put a value on things like that, and so you're not giving away your music for free. You're, you can literally put a value on uh, the television promotion. It costs this much to run an ad in television. This many people see it, and. I mean, you can put a value on it. So in a way, you're not giving it away for free at all either, in that sense. So I think that you have to, uh, you have to think about it like about investment. So it's something like return from investment. If you want to give it away for free, it's fine. But you have to check uh, what you, have, you can get from it. OK, so um, I'm, we're pretty much going to wrap up. Um, do you guys have anything to add? You have one more slide. I have one more slide, and I think this is one of the most important slides. And this is, if you don't, if you could, like forget absolutely everything that we've been mumbling about up here, remember this point, please. <laughs> Being a musician is work, so work hard. Every single day. There is no such thing, I mean, no successful musician in the world sleeps until noon, uh, gets high every night, like drunk all day like it just doesn't happen they're not successful they're in a gutter making music in their garage or whatever Exagger exaggerating but you should be waking up every day your schedule should be such that you get on your social media in the morning that's the first thing you do you check your social media you interact with your fans second thing you do go to your rehearsal space meet with your band rehearse if your band can't come compose sit play around third thing you do Get your instruments fixed. Do whatever it is that you need to be doing. Fourth thing you do, meet with your manager. Be on the phone. Fifth thing you do, end your day with some promotional activity. Go to bed. You've been working all day long, and you should be always doing that every single day. OK, thank you, guys. Um, we're going to open it up to the audience if you guys have any questions. Hi, thanks for that. Um, you just said that uh, making music is hard work. Um, so obviously at, at Spotify we would like that musicians um, have a lot of time for that work. And the question is how can we help make, help musicians spend more time on that and less time on all the other stuff? Is it like, would you like more data? Would you like features? How can we support that? I think that's an awesome question, not just to me, but also to the musicians here in the room. Did everyone hear it? Um, in my opinion, uh, it has a lot to do with data sharing, so I really liked how you guys opened up the data, because when I, as an artist, I can go to my artist profile, I can look at my statistics, I know who's listening to my music, so I know what language, for example, I'm going to write my Facebook post in that day. It's super fast, it's really easy, you don't have to sit there thinking, blah, 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 for example. Um, at the same time, as, also, as I mentioned at the very beginning, if you go back to the first slide, it's all about your team and delegating amongst your team as well. So yes, you have you your, as, as the musician, but you also have the other people involved. So you have your manager who you can request a lot out of. Um, you have your booking agents who should be doing their job as well, and you shouldn't necessarily be involved in that. The idea is that, yes, in an ideal world, you are focusing on making your music all day long. Um, but, and this is something that Misha actually said to me earlier, and now I remember I wanted to say that, um, figure out what your talents are as yourself. What can you do? You can play the guitar really well, but you can also, for example, write really well. So maybe you're the person that's writing your band's press releases because you can do that. Maybe one of the people in your band is an excellent artist, and so they're working on your graphics, they're working on your posters. Figure out what you guys can do to kind of divide the tasks that must be done amongst yourselves and really do that, really divide them, and really stay on top of each other. Set deadlines, set timelines, and that's pretty much that. Yeah, and I want to answer like a, 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 a movie composer. Of course, uh, I, I, I am a Spotify user because I really find it well and fine. But I think uh, you could invest in Polish festivals. Like uh, uh, you could set some kind of award or prize for for an upcoming new Polish band and. And there are a lot of festivals like Hanekan, for example, that you, you, you could uh, award them with, let's say, you know, Spotify star in, in Heineken, for example. So that's my answer. You could also pay musicians a little bit more per, 
song listen, that might be helpful as well. I think we just checked our, um, with the Eric Shoves, we just checked our streaming cells uh, for the past, I think, six months of the album being out. And it was something from Spotify like $27. And that's kind of a joke because there are thousands of plays per song. So that's a direct answer, quite frankly. <laughs> I'm, I, that's actually what I just asked for the microphone. And I literally wanted to say that. That basically why they don't spend much time on music might be that they're working. And the answer is that they need more money. But the other thing I wanted to say about the features, for, for me, it's interesting um, to know how many of the listeners are premium users as well. Uh, if I build a direct-to-fan campaign, um, I know how many people I can expect like would be the devoted fans who can pay more, who can buy the exclusive packages that are more important. So first of all, like cities to book tours, and second of all, also like premium versus um, just regular free users. Anybody else? No, I got one question to Magda. Can you move back to the numbers? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's, that's one. So just one idea that just came to my mind. Because when you look for the numbers from Polish market, it looks nice. But when you compare it for, with global market, it's the same story with Polish startups in tech scene. Come on, uh, even uh, all of the music market, it's the, when you compare the value uh, with one nice tech startup, it's the same, uh, same amount of money. So when you want to make something really good, you have also to think, think about global market since the day one. Uh, there's no time to, for waiting another month just reaching Polish market. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you guys for coming. That's it.